welcome to our morning service. Please take and join with us as we sing a new name written down in glory, hymn 279. Shall we stand as we sing? of your word. We know because you've already told us your word shall not come back unto you void. It is. It never goes out. It comes back empty. Amen. And so, Heavenly Father God, we just pray that it will do, Heavenly Father, as you have intended this day. And we will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to get right into this. And it, there was a old preacher in there, and they used to have quite a long song service, and and he would, he really loved to preach. And boy, there were certain areas of the scripture. He'd be, I mean, he would just be chomping to preach. And he would come up to his song leader and he would go, I'm ready, I'm ready. You know, like before the song leader was over. And I feel like that in Revelation. Amen. Okay. And we don't have that long a song service, but I mean, I'm back there going, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready, let's go. Uh, but again, just backing up here, I want to just take a quick look here. Uh, and pick up in about oh, verse 16. Uh, and it says, And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand. And I heard the number of them. And, and, and we have this amazing number of, of this, what is called this horsemen, this army that is going to be poured out, again, upon the, the earth, what? In the tribulation time. We also find out, as we went on a little bit further, in verse 17, that these weren't men. You know, a lot of times this has been placed with, well, that's, that's China. Only China can raise an army of that size. Well, when we looked a little bit further, well, I mean, they got heads like, the horses have heads like lions out of their mouth. It's just fire and smoke and brimstone. And on the breastplates of the soldiers, there's a fire. And, well, these are demons. These aren't men. 
And, and so as we walk through and we saw those things, and it talks about the fire and the smoke and the brimstone. And then verse 18, it says, by these three, smoke, fire, and brimstone, are a third of the part of the whole world of men. They're killed. Now remember, 25% had already died in the tribulation. Now a third, so that gives us approximately half of the inhabitants of the earth <coughs> during the tribulation period at this point are dead. They, they have been killed for their power. And again, talking back uh, of these uh, who are issuing the smoke and the fire and the brimstone, it says their power is from their mouth and, and in their tails. And their tails were like unto serpents, and their heads uh, with them do hurt. Notwithstanding, it says, the terror of the tribulation, and again, if, if we realize this terror is continual, it is just ongoing. And verse 20 picks up and says, And the rest of the men which were not killed, and this is where we kind of left off last week, and some of the things that, that always amaze me, and the rest of the men which were not killed, about half of the population of the earth is still alive. These pledge yet repented not of the works of their hands. They still didn't repent. Knowing, seeing, and, and we know by some of the other things that we're told in the word of God, they know that this is of God. They know, again, that this tribulation uh, is from God. They still won't repent. That they should not worship devils and idols and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither see nor hear nor walk they continue not only do they not repent they continue to worship that that cannot see nor talk those things made with their own hands and then verse 21 neither repented they of what their murder nor of their sorceries nor of their fornications nor of their thefts they refuse to repent, period. Even though half of the population of the world has already died, has already been killed during the tribulation, the half that is left are still saying, no, we will not bow the knee. We will not repent. And again, I've touched on it a couple of different times why I think they won't. They, they rejected God for the last time, and God has said, okay. The Holy Spirit no longer convicts them. They've denied God for the last time. That's that, my opinion as to why they do not repent. They cannot repent at this point. They rejected God for the last time. Now, picking up in chapter 10, and we expect, because we're walking through, and again, we are looking at the seventh trumpet judgment. The sixth trumpet has sounded. What we've just looked at there in chapter 9 is that sixth trumpet. And now we expect what to happen? Seventh trumpet, right? No. No, we go into ten and all of a sudden there, there's, this, there's this parenthetical again. They say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's other things going on. And, and I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever watched the, some of the old movies before they had voice. Okay? Back before they had voice, they just had Words were running on the bottom. You read, and you watched the movie, and you read what was being said and what was going on in the movie. And, and so, you know, something's going on, and, and, you know, Texas Joe walks in the bar, and there's this tremendous bar fight going on. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of the fight, goes, and back at the ranch. And they would switch and take you somewhere else. And then they would cover what was going on, and then, then they, they switch back to Texas Joe. Listen, they got that, I think, from here. All right. I, th I, think, I think Hollywood movies said, hey, that, that works in the Bible. Uh, why? Because this is back at the ranch. We're going along. We're seeing what's going on. We're following through these judgments. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. There's other things going on. There's some other things happening. And so we are brought then to this portion. Uh, and here in chapter 10, it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. His face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders 
uttered their voices. Wow. Listen, and when we walk into this and we start to see what, what, what's, what's going on, suddenly what is he talking about? There's another mighty angel, it tells us. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. What does this angel look like? Listen, he's clothed in a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun. And his feet as pillars of fire. And of course, it doesn't tell us specifically who this angel is. But most commentators, and again, this is speculation, but again, most commentators look at that and say, well, wait a minute. This mighty angel is clothed in a cloud. How is Jesus going to come? In the clouds. It says, and a rainbow was upon his head. Well, what, what's the rainbow symbolize? It's really that God will no longer judge the earth with what? A flood. But he's judging the earth now in tribulation. And, and so again, this one, they think it's Jesus. And so this one, and also one of the other things, matter of fact, Joe read it this morning in one of the verses that he read about the face of Jesus was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And it talks about, again, it, it, this, as it, Jesus is seen in, in different descriptions, uh, also back in the first part of the book of the Revelation, and, and in reference to him, his, his feet are as, as, as fine brass that, that was treated in the fire. And so a lot of people look at it and say, listen, this angel is Jesus Christ himself. Now, I like that. I think that that's an interesting part, and I can see how they bring that together, but we are not told specifically that this, in fact, is Christ. What we do know is this is another mighty angel, and this angel comes clothed in clouds and a rainbow upon his head, and his face as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. There is this mighty angel, and just to look upon this angel, it is, is awesome, okay? It, it just brings you, you, you're looking, and th this is a sight that has never been seen before. And so they, he looks, John looks upon this angel in verse 2, and he had in his hand a little book. The interesting thing is, he says he has a little book, and it says it's what? It's open. Listen, this, this book, he doesn't come, and, and it's closed book. Remember the seven-sealed book? We started back in the seven-sealed judgments. Uh, no, this book isn't sealed. This book comes and it's already open. And so he has in his hand a little book and he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the earth. And this angel and this book, this little book, uh, Bibliardion is, is the Greek word for this book. And it has the idea of a small scroll. And you know, they didn't have books like we have. They used scrolls. And now a big scroll, you would come up and you would lay it on a table and you would begin to unroll it and, and read. Now uh, this, this is what, it's a little book. And the idea here, it's a little scroll. And so he, come, he has this little scroll. And again, he is going to, as we will see in just a little bit, uh, he is going to do something very, very specific with this little scroll. And again, with his setting, his feet, one on the earth, one on the sea. What, what does this mean? Well, I believe, and, and most commentators believe, that what this means is th this is for the whole world. You know, within, a lot of times these mentions have been specifically for those on earth, on terra firma, on the ground. This is for God's entire creation. One foot on the earth, one foot on the sea. This is for the entire creation. And as they walk through those things, um, some have suggested that the content of this little book is what is, is recorded in chapter 11, 1 through 13. But we don't know that. You know, they want to go on to 11, which what? That's about the two witnesses. And they'll say, well, actually that little book contains then what is coming. Um, I don't know, I think that's a reach, but a lot of, if you read commentators, a lot of commentators will make that jump. Maybe. Uh, but again, it doesn't tell us that. And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. 
And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things uh, which uh, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. I think this is one of the most interesting parts that we run into here. Because he is being told, he is being given the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments. The seventh is coming here shortly, and we're going to see that. And then after that are the seven bold judgments. Listen, John is told in each one of these to do what? Write it. This is a communication to us. This is a communication that we might know what is going to be happening in the future during the tribulation time when God finally gets to that place that he brings judgment upon the earth. Now remember, all Christians have been raptured. We're gone. All the believers have been taken out of the world. And those who are getting saved during the tribulation, for the most part, what's happening to them? They're getting killed. Yeah, Antichrist is seeing that they're killed as fast as, as he can possibly kill them. And so they're, they're being taken out. Yes, there are a few believers. But the reality is here. Uh, and, and with this, now we have these thunders happening. I mean, we're given the other judgments and, and communicate them. Tell exactly what you see. Tell the people what's coming. We want them to know. But we come here, and this special, this mighty angel, with a loud voice, as when a, a lion roareth, when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, one of the things here, again, these thunders, I don't know how, I haven't had it happen since I've been in Alaska, but when I lived in Michigan, we had some real thunderstorms. And there would, there would be a time every once in a while, I mean, it, it would hit close, that thunder would go up like right over your head. It, it, it literally felt as though it just shook the place. And you would feel it inside, I mean, it was like a concussion. And you would, mm, well, that's kind of what I imagine. These thunderings are just concussions that are going on, but they're communicating something. He said, the voices, seven thunders uttered their voices. These thunders are communicating something. And again, what when we looked at the seal judgment, the trumpet judgment, we get onto the vile judgments, they, they're all communicating clearly what God is going to do. We have these, this thunder claps take place, and he said, wait a minute, because what does he say? And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, he heard them and he understood them clearly. So well, how do you know that? Because I was about to write. He heard them and he understood them clearly and he's about to write down what he heard. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things, which uh, the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And of course, Everybody who has ever studied this says, but why? You, you've communicated to us, again, the seals, the trumpets, the vials. You, you've given us all of this information, and you're showing it to John. John receives this information. Why seal it up? Why aren't you going to tell us? Listen, God has his reasons that we don't understand. And again, the speculation runs wild as to why they didn't do this. But I think some of it, <clears throat> if you will, the only thing the devil knows is what we know. The devil knows the Bible. The devil quotes the word of God. The devil knows the ways of the world. The devil knows all of those things. But if we don't know it, and God doesn't write it down, the devil doesn't know it either. Are these some things during that, that time period that God just said, nope, I don't want the devil to know that. And he just takes it and closes it up? I don't know. But what also, I think on the other side of that, or another possibility uh, of that, may also be that, is this about Israel? Is this about how God is going to deal with Israel? at this, if you could, sort of mid part of this, this horrible tribulation. 
Because remember, they're still God's what? Israel is still God's children. Is this closed up? Is this something he's going to do to and or for Israel? And, uh, and so he's just holding that back. Again, we don't know, but there's some very interesting possibilities as to why God has sealed these things up. And he's forbidden to write or reveal the contents of the seven thunders. A voice from heaven tells him, wait, hold it. No, those are to be sealed up. Listen, this isn't the only place. And you can go back, I'm not going to turn there right now. But to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4 is told to hold back. Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 is told to hold back. So it isn't the only time that there have been those writing the word of God and they're told to hold back. And so we, we see that also. 10 verses 5 and 6 is, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. You know, and again, this is a very interesting portion of scripture because here's this angel. And he's the one who's foot on the sea, foot on the land. And what's he do? He takes an oath. He makes a covenant. And he says, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Who is he swearing by? God, very God. Who liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that are that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are then are. Look, he created everything. He is the one on which I take this oath. And this is kind of interesting because the essence, it seems, of this oath is that there should be time no longer. Okay, we've come to the end, if you will. Uh, God has been walking through. He has been bringing judgment. Uh, men have still had the opportunity to repent, but as we just read, they refuse to repent. No matter what has happened, no matter how horrible a thing has happened, half of the population of the world is dead and men still will not repent. And again, goes in, in verse 7, it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, now remember, we haven't got to the seventh trumpet yet, and so when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. God has said, there's going to be an end of all of this. I am going to take care of sin. I am going to judge the nations. I am going to deal with all of these things. As he has told his servants, the prophets. And now we are to that place here in tribulation. He shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished. As he has declared to his servants, the prophets. Listen, this has always been a mystery. When is the end coming? When, when is that going to take place? When is this all going to culminate? When are we ultimately going to get to see what? A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem coming down. When are we going to get to see the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ? When are we as believers going to get to live with Jesus Christ at that point in time on this earth as Jesus Christ rules and reigns from what? The throne of David in Jerusalem. When's it going to happen? We've all been looking. We've all been, been wondering. We've all been thinking. And he is saying here at this point, this, these mystery of God should be finished. God is just about done with all of these things, with his judgment on mankind at this point. But of course, and we know, that at the end of the millennial kingdom, thousand years, what's then going to happen? They're all really, you know, Satan's released. He draws all those who will follow him together. They come against Jesus at Jerusalem. And the final time happens when it's just simply put down. And then righteousness shall truly rule and reign. Amen. That is truly when a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven takes place. But we've been looking, we've been waiting, 
when is this going to happen? When is this going to start? And he is very, very clear. We're getting close. God should be, his mystery of God should be finished. Verse 8 says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is in the hand of the angel, still in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And so there's this great angel, he's standing there, one foot on earth, one foot on the seas, and he said, go to him and get the book. And so I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it. And then, to be, I think, somewhat surprised, he said, here, here, take it. He doesn't say take it and read it. He says, what? Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten, eaten it, my belly was bitter. Boy, listen, and the idea there of, of, of the, the belly, that, that's, I mean, the whole inner being, the whole digestive system actually uh, is, is what that's a, a reference to. And it's actually the word uh, kolia in, in the Greek, which we get some of, again, some of our English words from. But it means the entire digestive tract. And so he, he's literally saying here, he's eating it. It tastes sweet as honey, but boy, when it gets to the belly, uh, boy, it turns bitter. It, 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 it starts to hurt. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a problem here. And so as he walks through, looking at these things, he eats it, and his belly gets bitter. And well, what's, what's that about? And again, man can do nothing but speculate, because it doesn't tell us. As I mentioned in, in uh, right after Sunday school this morning, we walk through and we always want to know, don't we? We want to know specifically. I want to know, what does that mean? I want to know about this little book. I want to know about him eating it. It tastes like honey, but it's bitter to his belly. I mean, why was that? What symbolism is this? And I want to tell you what, there's lots of people who have placed a lot of symbolism with this. That's exactly what does this mean. Number one, we don't know. But then, again, what, what might it mean? Well, what if... He is rejoicing and joyful over the reality. I mean, this is like honey, if you will, to him, because this book tells of the end of this judgment, the end of the tribulation. That's going to be sweet to one like John. But also within this book is also talking of the judgment that's brought against his own brother in Israel. Is that what that means? I don't know. But in looking at it, I can see where that kind of information, well, I, I take it, and oh, this is almost over. Praise God. But then the reality of what it, it says is that his brother in Israel is still going to be under condemnation. They are still in part of this tribulation until what? Until they repent. They must repent like everybody else. And until Israel repents. Again, it doesn't tell us clearly. That's a possibility. Verse 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again. Listen, at this point in time, as John is here on the Isle of Papa, uh, he has been here, they, they, again, they believe he's, he's about 90 years old or so at this point in time. And, and so he, he's not a young man. And yet, verse 11 says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And you think, well, how, how's this old man going to do that? I mean, how, how is he going to continue? I mean, they won't even let him off the Isle of Patmos. Um, he wrote the book of the Revelation, and he still speaks today. Amen. I believe that that's the idea here, is that which God had given him to write, 
that which again reveals all these things that are coming in the future, that that is set out before us this very day. The scope again of this future prophecy. It's universal the way that is written, that it's going to be peoples, nation, tongues, and kings. But the written word, the written record of John is still looked at today. The book of the Revelation, it's the capstone. It's that which completed the New Testament. And this capstone of the New Testament, listen, it has gone out around this world. And it is gone to the world, to the nations, in language. There is no book even comes close to the Bible is how many languages it's been translated into. This book, this part of the Bible, has gone around the world in languages far more than any other book. And it has gone before kings. Listen, John's writing of that which the angels called him to. Come up hither. And he has continued to be given information and more information concerning what is coming in these last days and throughout the tribulation. And that is what we're looking at. We will pick up with chapter 11 next week. And again, uh, one of those, those, those great uh, portions when we start looking at the two witnesses. And when man believes, so about the two witnesses, let me say this. When man believes they've got everything under control, God steps in. Amen. And the two witnesses are such a beautiful picture of the power of God and him, again, putting men in their place. But unfortunately, even having been put in their place, man will still defy God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, how we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. And when we come to the book of the Revelation, and we understand it clearly. Listen, this is what you have shown unto John. I do not have to explain the unexplainable. I don't have to explain those things that you have not given us clarity on. But I do have to believe it. By faith, I trust your word. By faith, I don't have to know what was in the little book. I don't have to know what made John's belly bitter. I don't have to know those things. But it's good to know that it did. It's good to know that there is a truth and reality in your word. And by faith, I simply believe it. I receive it, and I thank you for it. Heavenly Father God, as we in this service today, may you be honored. May you be glorified. You tell us there's a blessing for reading this book, for studying this book. God, may we read May we study it. May we draw closer to you in faith because of it. We thank you for it. I also pray if there are any here who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Heavenly Father, might this be the day of salvation for them. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.